I want to live in a world where the buyers make the decisions on their own, that they vet the problem, they look at the, the solutions, they look at it from every angle. You as the seller, you're, you're a guide of sorts, a Sherpa of sorts. You're just there to like help fetch them stuff. And uh, so great sales, who are, who are these great salespeople? And they're people who ask great questions to see uh, whether they're qualified for these solutions or not, to help find ways of approaching this and looking at this, you know, get them information, get their hands, um, and, then, and then help them make, make, make a decision that's good for them. Go what I love about it is it also takes all of the pressure off of the salesperson or business owner Mm -hmm. who is nervous about sales. Who's acting as a salesperson. Who's right. The the owner is the number one salesperson of practically any business. Absolutely. And, and so many of my clients, that's their sticking point. They're unbelievably good at delivering what they do, but if you can't have an effective, mutually beneficial sales conversation, you never get to do the thing your business does. Hi, I'm Erin Marcus, former corporate executive turned entrepreneur and founder and CEO of Conquer Your Business. Welcome to the Ready Yet podcast. We're excited to bring you more than 100 episodes of interviews and insights designed to help entrepreneurs get the financial and emotional freedom they need in order to build a business and a life they're proud of. All right, welcome to this episode of the Ready Yet podcast, where my guest today, Pat Helmers, and I have been trying three times to get the technology to cooperate. So we are hoping three times the charm here because I really, really can't wait to catch up with you and learn about everything that you have going on. We've known each other for a while, but we haven't really had a conversation in a hot minute. And I love your topic, sales, gotta love sales. So why don't you give everyone a quick a formal introduction of who you are, and we can jump into the thick of it. Well, I'm Pat. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I, I, I host the Sales Babble podcast, of which you were a guest, and um, I, just, I just looked it up today, and I saw that it, you were on the podcast on March 26 in 2019, and we talked about how to conquer the conversation in sales. So, all right. So I've been thinking about that. Interestingly enough, because that's where my business started, Conquer the Conversation. And in April of 2019, everything changed because I moved the focus to be about business overall. So I still talk a lot about sales, but Mm -hmm. it's more business strategy and marketing because, and you'll love this, you'll totally understand. Yep. What happened was as I was working with people on their messaging and this whole idea of communication, what I figured out was people really didn't know what they were doing for a living or how to build a business. So we had to back it up, right? We had to back it up. And my skill set was really in that business strategy and marketing. So you caught me right before I figured out what it was I actually was supposed to be doing. (laughs) That's like the number one problem that I've bumped into for years that people have is they don't understand their value proposition. Right. They don't understand their brand. They don't ex- understand exactly who they serve and why they serve them. Lots of times people through just kind of dumb luck find some levels of success, but to grow up beyond that, oh. they're, they're unclear what to do. Totally. And I call it The way that I describe it is people go out into the world with a business idea and they start doing random acts of marketing and random acts of business because they didn't do the work before going to work. They didn't sit down with the hard stuff, the hard thinking part of exactly what you were talking about. And so they just go out there and start talking and trying which, yeah, you got to get out there and talk and try, but you can make it easier on yourself. You sure can. I'm, I come from the tech space. So working with a number of uh, startups, when you're a startup, that's the, that's the fundamental thing you're trying to understand is like, I have an idea, I have an innovation, but who exactly would use this and what were the benefits they would experience? And how can I express that in a way that people can get excited about that? That uh, these are pretty common problems. It, and I, I 
kind of hook some of this up to the fact that you're just up against neuroscience because your brain is kind of like give yourself a break doesn't it's not an excuse for not doing the work but right. give yourself a break and some empathy because your brain is literally designed to keep you alive which means it only thinks about you so it's hard it's not easy work to try to figure out how would someone else feel like that about this how does someone else going to like this it's also kind of scary because now you're saying what if they don't like my idea it's or the ideas become something that you didn't want it you didn't expect it to be and you don't want it to be oh yeah like like i'm working on a project with three very good friends of mine and we had an idea an innovation in manufacturing that we started to build and we started to work with customers and listen to what they wanted and and start to start building uh, solutions that would work for them and the deep, deeper and deeper we got into it, we came to realize we don't want to be in this business. Isn't that there, horrible? <laughs> there's a business here. There's yes. money here. Sell um, it to someone else. <laughs> some, you know, so somebody could could give this a go. But if you don't have any passion around it, exactly, if this is not exactly what you want, um, you're you're never going to be successful. Um, so, and sometimes it goes the other way around. I have a passion about something I really want to do, but people may not have any may not find any value in that. Right, they don't want to pay for it. Totally. They're not going to they're not going to pay for it. So, yeah, that's these are tough problems. <laughs> these are but these are worthy problems to to approach. Yeah, I and mean, so many of my clients and so many people I talk to go into business because they love doing the thing that the business does. But owning and growing a business and doing the thing the business does for a living have nothing to do with each other. Nope. And if you're hell bent on doing the thing, you better find somebody to grow the business because it doesn't matter if you're the best dentist in the world. If nobody knows you exist, you're not going to get to do much business. I agree 100%. So in all these years that we haven't caught up in person, I know we chat <laughs> via LinkedIn. We tend to comment on each other's stuff. Yep. What has changed? This is great. Like, what is What did the pandemic do to your approach in your business? Oh, the pandemic. Oof. Just a little tiny off the cuff question. <laughs> right? Answer in 10 words or less. What did the pandemic do to your business? I think it, if, if, it was an opportunity for me to restart, to go back down to zero mm -hmm. and to kind of go back to my roots in my beginning. Because it was very difficult to, you know what it was like, right? We're all trying to busy ourselves with Zoom calls back in those days. And yep. it just, it was just, it was just painful. And, and eventually I just come, came to realize that um, I wanted to let some things go. And it yep. wasn't until I found something else to do, was I able to do that. And when things started to open up, it was, it was, it was, it was like perfect timing for that. And um, so. Well, yeah. the way that I describe what you chose to do is I mean, it's where my tagline comes from. The tagline for this business is be in charge, take action, get results, right? You didn't stay in reaction mode. You said, okay, here's my situation. Here's the world situation. Here's mm -hmm. my current situation. What do I want to do? Not what am I allowed to do? What's left over for me to do? What do I like? But what do I want to do? And then you go about creating Absolutely. it. So like, like one big change, I made a huge change in that. Uh, I, I've hosted this podcast, Sales Babble, and I've used it as a mechanism to to grow my brand. People know me, do consulting, things like that. But I got into a place where I got tired of interviewing people about sales because I pretty much understood what the answers were going to be before I ever asked them. And I just kind of had my fill. And I came to realize, like, I have something to say that nobody is saying. So you know what? I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to do something that they say you shouldn't do. I'm going to. I completely changed the podcast. Into me not interviewing anybody at all, but me just speaking. Me from going from a thirty-minute interview to a six, a six or seven-minute little solo episode, and I was, and I remember having the conversation with myself: or Are you going to be okay with this? You know, people are going to stop listening to this. This is going to bother some people. Some people want some other things, and I, I've been pretty successful as a podcaster. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, getting thousands of downloads a month and whatnot. And there was a drop-off, 
but I'll be darned if it didn't grow after a while. In fact, it grew to double some of the numbers I'd ever seen ever. Wow. wow. So I just don't, I, I don't, I don't, I, what, what it just kind of shows you is that not, not, nothing is for sure. You need to, you, you need to follow your bliss. And because of that, what I've decided to do was actually in those episodes was use it as a mechanism to create discipline for me to write a book. I've always wanted to write a book. I've started many books through the years. Have you really? <laughs> I have I'll, probably five. I'll maybe. give you what I did to start my book because I'm also now I, mm-hmm. I think you're further along than I am, but this is what I did. I booked my you're gonna laugh. I booked myself in April to be on a podcast that's only for authors. There you go. Because <laughs> right? I'm not going to cancel and I'm not going to show up and, you know, be the one guest that halfway through the interview goes, well, I didn't really do it. Right. So, right. You got to play tricks on yourself sometimes to get your. Well, well, that's what this is. What do they call these, you know, these, these kinds of uh, devices that kind of hold yourself in place? You know, I the, call them bumpers in my gutters. I need bumpers in my gutters. bumpers in your gutters. Yeah. I give myself that wide range, but I need bumpers in the gutters. <laughs> Two years, so uh, so it was in 2020, I guess I started this. And um, now I've got like a year and a half's worth of every every week I'm, I've am i been adding to the book and I've got more than enough now for the book. So now so I'm starting to do What's the book called? This. Let's get it's into called, it. It's called The Tao of Sales Babble. Like Tao, like Taoism. Nice. The Tao of Pooh. Oh, I'm way into the Tao of Pooh. I actually, yeah, we can go deep on... Uh, the Winnie the Pooh approach to management. <laughs> we can go there's the, all of the there's Winnie the Tao of physics book, right. you know, there's like, you know, but, but so, I am a Taoist, so okay. I couldn't help yeah. but want to see the world from this point of view. And that's how I've, and that's how I've always approached selling. And that's what the book's about. So what is the impetus? You said it's how I approach selling. What is your theory on that? that has made you so successful in that space that you see is the way to get the results? Um, I'm all about non-pushy sales. I come from technology, B2B sales, enterprise sales, where you go into a meeting, there's probably lots of decision makers. It's like herding cats. We're back on the cat thing, right? (laughs) There's been a conversation (laughs) about cats going on, yes. You know, and 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 from an industry that's all about push, push, push. Yeah. Be aggressive. Be assertive. You know. Um, you know, make your quota every month. You know, it's the end of the year. Got to make your quota. Get these people to buy. Why aren't these people buying? And yeah. do everything you can to strong arm them. And 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 as my years in sales, and and as a sales manager, VP of sales for a startup, I came to the realization: none of that crap works. No, I call it no offense. It's kind of the old white guy of sales. Yeah. It's the it, old it, white it, guy. Like, and, and it kind of worked. Small. It worked <laughs> fine because they opened the doors for each other. But the world doesn't work that way anymore. And it women are relationship based in general. Really? And it just, the world doesn't work. I think it has a lot to do with the internet, actually. Mm. Because now there's more power in the buyers. Oh, absolutely. So they can do a lot of the vetting of companies. They can do a lot of shopping on their own. Back in those days, in order to get a brochure, you had to talk to a sales guy. Right? Very true. You had you had to go to the showroom. You had that that that's just what you had to do. Because you um, had no information. And no. I've talked about this. My background in financial services, I've said this for over a decade. There's zero information I can't get my hands on. There is no mm-hmm. more gatekeeper. No. The salesperson used to be the gatekeeper of the information. That's and right. now what we look for is guidance and interpretation, not information, which means that's of higher value relationship. I want to live in a world where the buyers make the decisions on their own. You know, they vet, they vet the problem. They look at the, the solutions. They look at it from every angle. You as the seller, you're, you're a guide of sorts, a yeah. Sherpa of sorts. You're just there to like help fetch them stuff. And uh, so great sales, who are, who are these great salespeople? And there are people who ask great questions to see uh, whether they're qualified for these solutions or not. Um, help, find, help find ways of approaching this and looking at this, you know, get them information, get their hands, um, and, then, and then help them make, make, make a decision that's good for them. 
Well, it, what I love about it is it also takes all of the pressure off of the salesperson or business owner mm-hmm. who is nervous about sales. Who's acting as a salesperson. Who's, right? If for the the owner is the number one salesperson of practically any business. It, absolutely. Oh. And, and so many of my clients, that's their sticking point. They're unbelievably good at delivering what they do. But if you can't have an effective, mutually beneficial sales conversation, you never get to do the thing your business does. Right. So if you they could adopt a mindset of like customer support, which they're probably good at. Oh, right? absolutely. They, they don't have a problem with that. Absolutely. You take a customer sort kind of support attitude in selling, that's something they could become comfortable with. That's and if they can adopt that, then they can be very successful in sales. Wow. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's it's my approach as well. I one of the things I learned a long time ago is what happens when we chase people? They run away. Right? Like that's instinct. If you chase somebody, they run away. And for many people, myself included, when I'm working in a business where people are going to be nervous, people are going to be scared, I'm asking people to face things they're scared of and go bigger and dream bigger. If I have to chase you and convince you to work with me, you're not going to be able to do the hard thing Mm -hmm. that moves your business forward. Now, probably people listening to this might think, well, Pat, isn't this a paradox? I'm not supposed to be chasing these people. Why would they be running to me? Why would they do that? Why would they? Well, this is the power of Taoism because Taoism has this notion of Wu Wei. They call it actionless action or frictionless action. Mm. And it's the idea that even though you're not working hard at it, hard work gets done, which sounds like a paradox. That was hard for me. Me and my good blue collar Midwestern blood, the idea that things can work without it being hard work. Right. Took a hot right. Minute. <laughs> like so, 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 so the Dow has this idea, like uh, they use a lot of metaphors in there, like that water is soft, yet it can cut through the hardest of rock. Right. So like I have a bucket of water and I put my hand in it. It easy goes in, easy comes out easy. Right. And if I was to drip it on my hand, it would feel nice. But that drip is actually what cut the Grand Canyon which is 300 miles long and a couple thousand feet deep and with tenacity and time and patience, soft things can cut through hard things. What's that got to do with sales? Well, we'll look, look at it in the case of like follow-up. Follow-up is one of the weakest things that, that sellers have. The average salesperson follows up twice and then they go, oh, I guess they're not interested. <laughs> That's not because the case at all. It about, and to me, it's because they're making it about themselves. They're making the not now answer they received and they're interpreting it as the scary judgment about themselves. Right. I don't want to bother them. Right. Um, you know, they're, they're really busy. They don't like people being pushy and, or they don't like me. They don't like how I look. They don't like my stuff. When in reality, they're just busy. They're just half, busy. half the outreaches you have, you know, you message them on LinkedIn, you send them an email, uh, you might text them. You might leave a voicemail. You know, a lot of that stuff just gets lost. So why, why not why not be like that water dripping in the Grand Canyon to say, oh, I'm just going to set up a process. First, I'll LinkedIn them. Then I'll send them an email. Then I'll leave them a voicemail. And then I'll go back and send them another LinkedIn. Then I'll send them another email. And I'll just do it like three times, right? That's nine That's nine touches, you know? And 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 the vast majority of the people, in my experience, eight, eight, nine out of 10, We'll get back to you. Absolutely. As long as you're coming with what I just call clean energy. If you're coming with my intention behind my outreach is connection first. So you never know when the person, like the way that I go into any conversation is I am open to anything happening. I'm open to anything happening. I don't have any preconceived notion of what the outcome is going to be. I'm open to anything happening, including a sale, by the way. A lot of people take that to mean, oh, I shouldn't look for a sale. No, that's not what I said. I'm open to a sales conversation, but you never know when 
who you thought might be a prospect wasn't a good prospect, but then they got me a speaking gig or they introduced me to somebody or they gave me a great idea or I don't know, just put a freaking smile on your face on some days. Like oh, I, I have an even more ne- negative view on this in some regards. I have the expectation that these whoever I'm talking to is, is not going to buy. They're just not going to buy. <laughs> it's like cutting it off right there. You know, but, you know, let's talk to them. But as I have a good feeling they may not buy, but they might know somebody who could buy. And and people never take that extra step of saying, you know, like uh, I was I was at a meetup the other day and somebody was saying like they were trying to sell me health insurance because it's that time of year. Right. Yeah. And and they but they didn't ever ask me. And if I was interested in this, they just started explaining it to me and they never went to the point of like asking me, do I know anybody who might be looking for health insurance? And actually, my son does is. But they never asked me about they him. Never. And that, and. And because I was thinking about that later on going, well, power. if they had asked me about that, I might said, well, you know what? Actually, I do know somebody who might, but they didn't do that. So that's that's how I, I see this thing. It's like it's not it's not about I like how you put that. It's about the relationship. It's not about the deal. Right. It's not about the transaction in the moment. Love what you're learning here and interested in more? Check out conqueryourbusiness.com to get immediate access to all sorts of additional resources and stay updated on our upcoming training events. I had somebody recently come to me. I met him two years ago. Really like him. Love his business. Love his story. Great guy. We met at an online networking event, right? And we just kind of hit it off. And we stayed in touch. I invited him to the free things that I had. He was brand new to business. He comes out of manufacturing. So brand, brand, brand new to business. And he would ask me a question now and then, and I would just answer it. What's the big deal, right? He'd ask me a question. I'd answer it. He would check in with me. I would check in with him a couple times a year. And it just turns out last December, you'll love this being in sales. Last December, I'm like, hey, why don't I know what you're doing? Catch me up. That's all I said. Why do I not know what you're doing? Catch me mm-hmm. up. How's it going? And he wrote back to me saying, it's time. And I'm thinking it's time for what, right? He goes, I'm ready. What would this look like? Like ready for it. Turned into a private client. And in one day we spent together, we reframed exactly what we were talking about in the beginning. We reframed how he was talking about his business. He's fantastic at what he does, but he has had no frame of reference for sales and marketing. So we put together what we needed to put together. And overnight, he was able to go from selling some, um, the one thing that he did for $2,500. Within a week, he has three different people interested in $25,000 package. And it was just, there were, you want to talk about no friction? Because I wasn't chasing him. He wasn't avoiding me. We were just staying in touch to see, hey, how's it going? And when it was time, it was time. And that's when it worked for him. Because I will tell you, if the conversation that I had with him that day, if we, if I would have tried to have that with him two years ago, it wouldn't have worked. It wouldn't right. have worked. Right. He wasn't ready for it. His business wasn't ready for it. It is now. It's freaking killing it. These things take time. It's and like it, the season. It's like the seasons, you know, you know. Winter follows launch. fall, fall follows summer, summer follows yeah. spring. You just, it's, it, it's just a time for these things. And it's uh, very hard to play a long game when your lifeblood is contingent on every sale that you have. And it's very hard to play a long game when we are immersed in a culture that has no patience. I know. People think that robocalls and tons of Instagram posts. And hey, girl, hey messages. I don't know if you get those, but the hey, girl, hey from the direct sales. Like that doesn't work. I get get regarding, right? Regarding, yes. Right? Immediately it looks like, oh, we're in the middle of a conversation. That's baloney. Yes. We're not in in the middle of a conversation. I suddenly receive those too. I'm like, wait, do I know this person? It just throws No, they're just a question for you. I would love then your advice, ideas on 
if sales is a long game and it's about the relationship and this whole idea of frictionless action, how do you keep the positive mindset that this will work? It's, it's all about mindfulness. Mm. It's all about understanding how the world is. And a lot, a lot of people struggle with the world because they want it to be something that it can't be. Yes. As opposed to accepting it for what it is. What do they say? It's like the idea of, right? Well, <laughs> it's like the idea that you go to Baskin Robbins and they got 37 flavors. And you go in there and I want butter pecan or something, right? And they go, we don't have it. And you're like, what? How can you be Baskin Robbins and not have every single one I've ever been to has got this? And some people live their life like that. I can't believe you don't have that. As opposed to, well, what do you got? Well, we got vanilla and we got chocolate. I'm like, okay, I'll take one off. Right. What are they? I've heard this. The um, the difference between reality and expectations is frustration. When your reality, right, when your expectations are up high and your reality is down here, that space is where frustration lives. Yeah. And like you said, a lot of people choose to live in that space. But but I found in my in my life, the more generous and kind I am, and the more engaging and the more energy I put into things, yeah, um, things will work out. Don't always know how. <laughs> and. Don't- <laughs> yeah, I- <laughs> <laughs> things will work. It's not what you thought you wanted. But it's one of the best. Um, I tell a story about how I didn't get what I wanted. I was in a program and we were, you know, it was like a manifesting, what are you going to make happen type of thing. And at the end of the 30 days, we went back through and I completely did not get what I wanted, like completely not get what mm-hmm. I wanted. Mm-hmm. And then the facilitator said, okay, but what did you get? And then I looked and finally I went back and I took inventory of what did happen during those 30 days. And what I wanted was like to hit a $50,000 in those 30 days. Didn't hit it. Didn't have a bad month, but didn't hit 50. And, but what I got, I call my million dollar plan. Because Mm. if I would have gotten what I asked for, I would have gotten $50,000. Okay, fine. But what I got instead was the foundation that's going to let this year be a million dollar year. Wow. But we don't stop and take that inventory. We just stay focused on, I didn't get what I wanted. We stay focused on looking good to other people and not being ashamed and not being embarrassed. And we put a lot of energy into, <laughs> and this is especially, social media has made this all the more oh, worse. It's horrible, right? It's hard. That's, and, and people somehow think that, you know, clicks and likes and stuff like that are, are what makes for dollars, but but it doesn't for the vast majority of the people, you know. So um, it's about mindfulness, I believe. I, I, I Again, I just can't help but repeat, I, the, the kinder you are, the more generous you are, the more giving you are, the more patient you are, the better listener, it will, it, it will, it, 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 it will clarify itself. There, there's a quote that the Tao has that says, do you have the patience to wait until your mud settles and the water is clear? Oh. Because you think about it, you shake, shake it all right. up, you shake up the river and it's all muddy and everything. But if you have the patience and let it clear, then you can see, oh, there it is. That's the thing. And most I, people just don't have that. It's just, and- they just. They don't have it. I'm going to share this with you. I had a moment where I was, I, in pa- patience is not my strength more for myself than anything externally. I get very impatient for, with myself. And I was talking to somebody who said to me, do you know what impatience is? And I'm like, what? And she said, entitlement. Uh. I was so horrified with my, you want to talk about some things like you take years to learn and some things change in an instant. I have never again, ever, it's been years since that conversation, since that moment in time. And she said, why should it work for you overnight when other people have to work years at this? And that was it. It was over. Oh my goodness. I've never heard that. That is brilliant. Entitlement. It's in, impatience is a form of entitlement. Why should you have something instantly? And I always thought, oh, for have me, you met me? 
<laughs> totally, totally, totally I this. thought it was okay for me to be impatient with me because I was all nice and good person, Aaron, because I wasn't being patient externally. So that made it okay. It was inward when the reality is I hadn't done the work to become the person I needed to be to show up the way I needed to show up to receive what I was trying to create. That's entitlement. I love that. I had to write that down. I was horrified yeah. with myself. Like this was yeah. so far from my, what I consider okay and not okay, right? From my value system and everything. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. entitlement is something that really rubs me the wrong way. And here I was unbeknowingly emulating it all over the place. Right. Yeah. Changed in a second. But I think you're absolutely right. We don't have the patience. And again, not that it lets you off the hook, but my God, it's hard to have patience these days because we are just inundated and immersed in instant gratification is the answer, period, hard stuff. Yep, that is totally true. It reminds me of another quote. Um, from Lao Tzu. Lao Tzu was the guy who wrote a lot of this Taoist stuff down. Um, he, he said, to realize that you do not understand is a virtue. To not understand is a virtue. To realize that you, do not un- that you don't understand is a defect. Too often, we think what's best for people as sellers. This is clearly the right thing for Oh, me. yeah, absolutely. You know, you know, I, I I could totally help you. I was just talking to a guy who wrote a book last week. He's like, oh, you're going to love this book. It's got all these characters, these people. I was like, and the more he talked about how uh, how much I'm going to write it, I'm going to love it, the more I disliked it. <laughs> Isn't it there, right? Yeah, no, I have and, and I'm reading the book. <laughs> and I don't. And I don't love it. And I'm, you know, and I, I get that he's excited about that. Good for him. But the idea that eh, this might be the right book for you, you know, some, some of these characters are kind of interesting. Uh, when, when you tell people you're good, that is bad news. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we have to learn a different way to speak. Not, you know, and, and different to different extent for different people. But for me, I'm careful about the language I use. Not only because other people are hearing it, but because I'm hearing it, mm-hmm. right? Like if you're, you know how there's couples that complain about each other all the time yeah. and right. And <laughs> I say to, I, I have a couple of those people in my life and I'm like, you're making your relationship worse. Not because like you're hearing yourself complain all the time. So you're convincing yourself that that person's horrible. Cause that's right. Sure. Right, because what they're doing is they're they're creating a conversation that they're getting they're hearing every day, yeah, about about a reality that they think exists, yeah, and, and, that, and it's just reinforcing it, just reinforcing it, just reinforcing it. Goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Goes back to your mindfulness idea, and I think if we can stay present, and it's a practice. I mean, this is this is not my default. This is something I have to very very intentionally work at. Um, it gets easier, then there things happen, and it gets harder again, but observing instead of judging questioning instead of answering wow isn't that interesting i wonder why they did that wow isn't that interesting i wonder what they think instead of assault and assumption yeah but if you can bring that energy to your sales conversation it changes everything could could we talk about lead generation for a second Absolutely. So in Taoism, there's this notion, Lao Tzu wrote that to act without doing, to work without effort. Act without doing, work without effort. So it's just like somehow stuff's going to get done and I'm not really going to be putting my shoulder to it. So it's, it's like this idea that I can get across the lake by rowing. Or I could put a sail up and let the wind take me. Relax. <laughs> yeah. Right. And in and in sails, there's just too much of this idea that we need to row. 
we need to pound the phones. We need to call up a, we buy a list, you know, or, or, um, or we download a list for something and we just call them all up, just call, 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 and just kind of beat on it, beat on it. As opposed to a world of, which I think would make a lot of sense in the kind of business people you work with, is just building a set of relationships and a network and just constantly keep touching in with that network. So much easier. It's like, it's like sailing. You know, it's, how's it, it going? It What's going on? With friends. Yes. Instead of chasing people. And here's the difference, though. I want to point out, because you are not saying this, but people will interpret it this way. You're not saying take zero action. No. You're not saying take zero action. No, oh, I'm running up the sail. Right. What you're talking about. <laughs> I got the about, rudder in my hand. I exactly. Got the it's <laughs> taking ease of action what's the energy you're putting into it don't it's the difference between serving and forcing and the other thing i think that stops most people from being effective this way is to me and what i have found is the other piece that's key for the easier less friction formats to work is that i have to show up 100 percent authentically so that my people are attracted to me. The yes. force comes when you're trying to get, when you're being inauthentic or you're not authentic yourself. So you're trying to force people into your space and showing up as your authentic self, not so easy. Not so easy <laughs> for a lot of people. See, that, that's just, again, that's very about scary. That's about mindfulness and understanding who you are, understanding that. I'm good at this and I suck at this. You know, I'm, I'm a good person when it comes to this situation. I am, I am, but you know what? I'm not, I'm a, I'm not the best of person. And as long as we understand what that is and something that we're always working on, like I'm a big, I'm, I'm a big proponent of the stoic journal. Like every morning I write down, what did you do good yesterday? And, you know, what did you do poorly? And what are you going to do to be a better version of yourself? You know, I mean, just write just a little bit. But I don't write a lot, you know, half a dozen sentences. That kind of mind, that kind of mindfulness helps immensely through the years. Unbelievable. Just that doing that little bit of of uh, of, of effort makes just a huge difference. Yeah, that's awesome. how you show up being your authentic self. Yes, absolutely. All right. So if people want to continue this conversation with you. I know you're not hiding if they want to make sure that they have the information for when the book comes out. I am looking forward to it personally. What's the best way for people to find you? On LinkedIn. Pat Helmers on LinkedIn. Uh, I would love it if they start listening to my podcast, Sales Babble. Perfect. It's all about the Dow of Sales Babble. That's that's what we talk about. And it sounds like it's in bite-sized, digestible chunks, which is yeah. fantastic. We, we, yeah, we do a little. We we do a little uh, phrase, bit kind of based on the on the Dow on in a selling context, and then we tell a little fable, a little story with these characters called Pat, Chris, and Lee. They're androgynous names on purpose. There you go. <laughs> and they tell little vignettes about selling. You know, so it's great for both sales managers and salespeople because you can see it from both ways. And it, it's the type of thing I do a lot in my world. I just call it setting my stage. Mm -hmm. So I, I review, for example, in my morning routine, I review my goals. It sets my stage so that as I make decisions during the day, I'm remembering what I'm trying to achieve and it prevents squirrel brain. Right. Oh, and yeah. yeah. And so for, it sounds like the way that you've set up this podcast, the sales babble podcast would be a great way to set your stage before you go into sales conversations. Yeah. Yep. 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 Yeah. If people could do that. That would be awesome. There you and, go. Marketable. And it's been awesome. I am so, so kind of you, Aaron, to have me visit awesome. on today's podcast. I really appreciate it. It's been great catching up. I can't wait to, for the book to come out and see what's next. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you.